Thank you. Can you hear me with the microphone? Can you hear me in the back? No. No? <laughs> OK. Well, hello, everyone. Hello. Ah. <laughs> wow. Look at all of you here. This is amazing. Look at all of you here because you want to protect your children. It's very inspiring. And, and I'm trying this one instead. Should I turn this one off? How's this? Hi, everyone. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you all. I, I'm so touched and inspired that so many are here right now for so many reasons. I know some of you are here just simply to support me, and my gratitude for you is endless. Um, blast from the past. This was like, this is your life <laughs> flashing before me. I'm, I'm so moved and touched. And just thank you for being here with me in this moment. Thank you. It means the world. So. We are about to share this space for the next 90 minutes or so. So I want to outline what we're going to kind of cover. I think that helps a little bit. So I think we're, I'm going to take you all together on a little journey tonight, I think. And half, like the first half of the journey might be a little unsettling, a little bit frightening. But if we are going to protect our kids, we need to know what we're up against. You know what I mean? We really need to understand. So I'm going to be sharing some statistics, some facts. I'm going to be sharing parts of my own story of abuse. I think it's really important that we hear those stories so they illuminate some of the lessons. I think that's important. But the second half of the journey is a little bit more fun, probably not fun, but a little bit more hopeful, a little bit more empowering. I'm going to just empower you with some practical skills and tools you can use right away with your kids. I'm going to share information on dangerous behaviors predators use warning signs and symptoms of sexual abuse victims. I'm going to talk about a really good language of safety you can use with your kids right away. That's not scary. That's just personal safety information. We're going to talk about teams and technology. And I really want to save time for question and answers. I think that's so important in discussion. I learn a lot every time I do this. And I, I did. I brought some, some books along that I'm happy to sell and, and sign if anybody is interested. OK, and then we're all going to have an adult beverage after. <laughs> Does that sound good? I know that's in my future. <laughs> so I, I want to say a couple of things. The first thing I want to say, and I say this to every group that I speak to, is, as I mentioned, I'm going to share parts of my own story of abuse. And mine involves, hi, Stephen. Mine involves um, a teacher of mine who abused me. And I want to make this very clear that the vast majority of teachers are amazing incredible and would never ever harm a child okay very clear about that and we just need to educate these wonderful ones on what to look for in the abusive ones okay the second thing i want to say um, involves the first statistic i'm going to talk about and it's one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually exploited by the time they're 18. okay and the statistic is out there in, in for a variety of forms but what, sometimes what we tend to forget is like that one boy and the one girl, they grow up, right? So we have a lot of wounded adults like walking around us. And so while you're listening tonight, and if any of this is difficult or you're triggered or something like that, it, it can happen because I know with 100% certainty that anytime I'm speaking to a group, I'm not the only survivor. I know that because of math, <laughs> and I know that because every time someone comes up to me afterwards with their own me too story so i want you to just take care of yourselves during the talk do what you need to do to feel safe know that you are not alone that you survived and you're here for a wonderful reason to protect our kids okay sound like a plan okay so i want to start off with you know i get asked occasionally like some people don't really know if sexual abuse of children is that big a deal um, i forget that not everyone is in my little circle of this career and so sometimes they're not so sure and so I want to talk about this a little bit with some statistics. And the first one I already shared with you. That's a pretty staggering number. Um, is anyone doubtful of that first statistic? Does it surprise you? Some yes, some no. It's interesting. It's really, really common, OK? The second statistic is so important to know, OK? 90% of sexual abuse victims that are kids are abused by someone they know and trust. So I think we all are really pretty good now at the whole stranger danger thing, right? Don't you think? I think I hear parents, it's, it's not too difficult to say, don't get in the white van. <laughs> My poor son, he's like, Mom, I know. Don't get in the rape van. He calls it the rape van. A white van will be going, don't rape van. It's sad. Oh. 
you know, he's heard it so many times. And it's important to teach that stranger danger because that exists, correct? But if that is all we focus on is stranger danger, we're addressing like this, this much of the problem. But it's really scary. It's a lot harder to teach, you know, how do we deal with the other 90%? And we're going to talk about that, okay? So I mentioned that my abuse involves a teacher. And what I was shocked to find out when I started doing research and started doing trainings and things is I am so not alone in this type of abuse. This statistic was taken in 2004, pre-Facebook, pre-social media frenzy, pre-everyone having a smartphone, OK? 2004 by the Department, US Department of Education. Nearly one in 10 students will experience some form of sexual misconduct by a school employee by his or her senior year. It's 4.5 million children. That is an epidemic, my friend. Okay, it's huge. This one, people don't talk about very much. That's my experience. 40% of victims are abused by older or more powerful children. Child and child sexual abuse is a huge underreported problem. A lot of issues there because people don't just wake up at 25 and start abusing usually. So it's just something to think about. Now, before you're all ready to jump off a bridge because these are so depressing, <laughs> the good news is that so much of abuse is preventable with education and training. So much of it. We just need to know. Well, we don't know. We need to know. So I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Okay, so I want to tell you just pieces of my own story. I wanted to tell you the pieces that happened to me that I think will be most useful for you in, in, in learning about how to keep your kids safe. And I think it's important that I have, this is my high school yearbook picture, I think it's important because I'm, not only because I'm rocking the 80s hair so well. I know there's a hairdresser in here, don't look. <laughs> oh my lord. But it's because I'm, you know, I, I show this in trainings because I'm usually standing up here like this middle-aged mom, you know, or whatever, oh, I'm almost past middle age now, oh my god. Anyway, um, but I was a kid, I was a kid, and it's, it's important for people to remember that it's not just me talking up here now, I'm healthy, I've worked through my, some of my stuff, and I, but I was a mess, and I was a kid, I was a vulnerable kid. So this is what I want to share about the child I was that made me such an easy target. And that is so important to know that these predators target their victims, okay? And my book is called Invisible Target for a reason, you know. So I grew up here, I grew up in Norwood. And it's so funny because I usually do these trainings, you know, mostly in Florida, but other parts. So I, I have to explain where Norwood is. And I always joke and say, I'm from Norwood, from Norwood. And they all laugh. But here I'd be like, I'm from Norwood. They're like, yeah, yeah, right now. <laughs> it's so funny how like the accents come back to me. My R's are dropping like flies. It's so funny. I love it. Sorry. Okay, focus. So um, I grew up, I went to, ABC Nursery School with Mrs. Boomhauer. Does anybody remember? I went to Prescott School. I went to Prescott School. I went to the Junior High South back then, which is now the Coakley. And I went to the high school, and it looks just the same as when I attended. <laughs> this is beautiful. This is a beautiful building. And I went to Bridgewater State for undergrad. I went to Boston University for my master's degree. So for just about half of my life, I was a Norwood girl. And this happened to me. This stuff can happen everywhere. Like some people think it won't happen, it, it happened to me here, okay? And so I grew up in a really chaotic and abusive household, very much so. And as a result, I became a very depressed, isolated kid. I was really suicidal at times, like badly suicidal. I wore a mask of happiness when I could. Um, I was isolated. I had like negative self-esteem. I felt apologetic for existing. But the, I think the most important thing for our purposes tonight were that I was longing for a father figure. Biggest part. I just wanted to be special. I just wanted to be seen. I just wanted to be, matter to somebody. Okay. So that's who I was. I wrote an entire chapter about this. But that was like two lines. So I'm going to be having to leave out some stuff. Okay. I know that this slide is going to be hard for some of you to see. It's so different to every other training, any other place. So they don't know, but some of you had them as a teacher. Some of you worked with them. Some of you were friends with them. It, 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 creating this training was very different for me. So I debated putting this up here. And then my husband, you know, the, the, the truth keeper in my life, he's like, silence. 
it doesn't do anyone any good. It doesn't, it perpetuates everything, so. This was Mr. Baker. He was a science teacher at the junior high south, which was seventh through ninth grade back then. He was 18 years older than I was. He was married. He was the JV baseball coach. He was the go-to grown-up for many children who wanted to talk about their problems, who wanted to hang out, who wanted to talk about cool music, who wanted to talk about sports. A lot of former students or people who had graduated would come back and visit him during class. We would sit there and watch them come back and we wanted to be in that inner circle so badly. He hung out with a lot of kids. He spent extra time. He was really caring. And I, I often say, like, students loved him, the parents trusted him, and the school awarded him. And does that sound familiar with any other stories that you ever hear? Okay, he appeared to be above suspicion, which is a really common dynamic in these situations. Okay, he is someone who took himself very seriously, big temper, unpredictable, really funny, spent so much time with certain children. And so we all thought he was the nicest guy in the world. Well, not all of us, I'm learning, but a lot of us did. Okay. So the grooming process. I want to talk about this a little bit. I actually, this is where I want to spend the most time talking about my story. Because this is so important that you understand grooming because this is where you can stop it. This is where we can intervene. These are the things we can see that can be tangible almost, and this is where we can intervene. Grooming is, I wrote an entire chapter just about this. Are you starting to hear, are you familiar with the term grooming in terms of abuse? Some yes, some no. We're starting to hear about it more in the news. Certain situations are there. I'm so glad they're mentioning grooming, okay? Let me see if I can explain. Grooming is a set of behaviors that predators employ to gain trust of their victims by blurring boundaries, sometimes pretty slowly, other times not so slowly, through a variety of means so that it's easier to abuse their victims. A lot of times they're not going to be able to just grab a kid and go in the back of the classroom and abuse, and that happens, but most of the time this is what's in place. So that's like the definition, okay? I want to explain to you what the grooming process looked like in my life and what it felt like, because that's what you need to understand. Okay, I'm going to take a little sip of water, excuse me. Okay, so ninth grade was the last year of junior high for me. So he befriended me, and I thought I was the luckiest person in the world. I was lost, lost, lost. I was so depressed, and all of a sudden I mattered to somebody really cool, the Mr. Baker. And so I started hanging out with him at lunchtime in his class, sometimes with other kids and sometimes alone. I would talk to him after school, sometimes with other kids, sometimes alone. He was the best listener and made me feel so much better. I felt cared about. And he, I talked about, I opened up in ways I, I never had in the past. And he would start taking me places, sometimes alone, sometimes with a little, my brother, sometimes with friends, sometimes alone, and because this is what he did. He, he did this with so many, he groomed everybody. He groomed everyone. So that if anyone ever mentioned, like, it's like kind of weird, I don't know, it's just what he does. He's just really caring for the kids who really need someone who needs to listen, okay? And so as the year progressed, I got closer and closer to him. The last day of ninth grade, he gave me a present. I went to go visit him, and he bought me a present. And I couldn't believe it that anybody would buy me a present, never mind Mr. Baker. And it was a windmill music box that played the theme song from Romeo and Juliet. And he said to me, I had to get this for you because I realized I'd become so attached to you, I'm going to miss you this summer. And I was so conflicted. I was so flattered that anyone, that he took his money, he went, spent his time and picked out a gift for me. I couldn't believe it. I was so touched and honored. And then the other side of me felt really funny. I was so uncomfortable. I, something felt, the way he was talking, the words he was using just felt grown up and creepy when it was the first time I wanted to leave his room the whole year. But I wasn't raised to trust those instincts and that gut feeling. So I dismissed them because that's what I had done my whole life. And so I just took the gift, which was nice. Moving on to 10th grade, I'm in high school, but almost every day I took the bus to go visit him, okay? And 
I opened up more and more, we came closer and closer, and he started to change a little. The way he talked to me was different. He talked to me more like a peer. He started opening up about issues in his marriage. And he started telling me things, like he started to build me up and compliment me and say, you know, I can't talk to anybody like I can talk to you. You're so beyond your years. And I believed him. I believed anything that man told me because he was Mr. Baker. And I called him Mr. Baker forever because that power differential never went away. And that is what it is always about, is a power differential. And so the emotional entanglement is really hard to explain. But it, it was like a magnet. Like it, was, it, it got so intense. And what I found was, all through that next year, into my junior year, my depression was lifting. I wasn't suicidal anymore. He was like my hero. He was like saving me. That's what I saw. And he meant the world to me. He became my best friend. Okay, does that give you a little bit of a sense of the process here? Now this was about two years. Have I mentioned any like line crossing or sexual abuse yet? Nothing. This was all grooming. Okay. So he crossed the line earlier on but not in my mind at all. He was just this nice guy who I thought everything was great. Well, I mean, a little weird that it was, you know, this friend was a lot older than me, but he was so kind to me. Made me think I was pretty, made me think I was smart. I never thought any of those, okay? So junior, uh, junior year, so, um, yeah, 11th grade, my mother went to the junior high, didn't tell me, and had a meeting with them and said, look, I really appreciate what you've done for Andrea. You've helped her, you've been this mentor, really appreciate it, but I want you to back off because I'm afraid she's going to get hurt. That's, that's what she said. And he told her, and she also said, don't tell her that I asked you to, just do it on your own. Okay. And so he said, I would never want to do anything to hurt her. Of course not, you know, no problem. So I went to go see him that day after school, like I always did. And normally when I would go in to visit him, he would be sitting behind his desk and I would just sit in a chair, very much teacher, student, but not very confusing, okay? This time he was sitting, I don't know if it's still like that, but the science labs had like the big black tables. Do you remember those? I don't know if they still have them. He was sitting on top of the, the science lab table. And he had two pieces of yellow lined paper. I still can see it, and like with notes on, on both sides. And you know what my first thought was? I thought I was in trouble. I, that's how young I was. Like, I, I screwed up, I'm in trouble, I'm gonna get in trouble. That's all I knew, okay? And he ended up telling me everything that my mother said. And in, this is verbatim. This is what he said after he told me about their conversation. He said, I guess we should abide by her wishes, but I don't think I can. I've become too attached to you. I can't live without you. Okay? Talk about conflicted again. Like, Mr. Baker can't live without me? Are you kidding me? That was mind-blowing to me that anyone could feel like that, never mind him. I had him up here, okay? The other part of me was really scared. Like, this isn't normal, this isn't okay. Something I knew was wrong in that gut, but again, I did not have the tools or the skills to listen, hear that voice, or know what to do. And the other piece was, all I knew was I was not going back to that depressed kid again. There was nothing that could get me to go back to how miserable I felt. And I was afraid if someone took him away from me, I would crumble. So that was the line in my mind that was drawn. I'm like, I, I can't, you know, I have to be with this man. I don't know what that means, but I, I have to. Like, it doesn't matter what she thinks. She's wrong. He hasn't done anything to me, right? He didn't do anything wrong in my head. What is she talking about? So within weeks of that, he had me at his house. I had just turned 16 and he wanted me to see his Christmas tree lights. And we were sitting on his couch and I could not believe I was in his house. I felt like I'd won the lottery of peeking into his life and so curious about how he lives and everything. And he was sitting behind me and he's put his arms around my waist. And I froze, I couldn't breathe at all. I was like paralyzed. I was really scared because no one had ever even touched me like that. And it was him but you can't say no to him because Mr. Baker, right? Which is a key part. You can't say no to him because he's Mr. Baker. That's the problem with all of this. And he said, there's something I need to tell you. 
you don't have to answer. I don't expect you to say anything, but I can't go on anymore without telling you this. I have somehow fallen in love with you. You're that special. I never thought this would happen, but I'm in love with you. I can't remember what I said. I have no idea what I said after that. But all I know is I, I, like, things went black. I was terrified. I was flattered. These conflicted feelings are, are so important for you to know because nothing's black and white. That age is so confusing anyway. Never mind this scenario. And so when we went to leave, we were at his door and he kissed me. And it was like a five second simple little kiss. How do you think I felt? Conflicted. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? Ugh. I did, like nothing in me wanted to kiss this man. Um, I was going to say something mean. I'm not going to do that. I did not want to do anything like that. But apparently this is what was the next step. So, okay. And it was so confusing. And so when we went to drive home, there were like three things I want to, I want to tell you about. One is that I kept looking out the side mirror, looking for the cops. And I didn't know why, but I just kept looking for the cops. I felt like I was going to be in trouble. The second thing was, he said, now nobody can know about this. They're not going to understand how special this was, this is for us. They're not going to get it. I will get fired and go to jail. If that happens, I will kill myself and that will be your fault. And I don't want that responsibility on your shoulders. Those exact words. And what do you think I thought? I totally believed it. I believed everything that came out of that man's mouth. So absolutely, I am the secret keeper. That is fine. And then the last thing he said was, I want to take things at your pace. I want this to be a good experience for you. I want you to feel okay. We don't have to do anything you're not comfortable doing. And the first thing was just total confusion. Like I, re I was pretty naive back then. I had no idea what he was talking about at first. Like what pacing for what? And I had to go, oh God, there's going to be more than kissing. And, but right away you're like, okay, I guess that's what happens next because he's, he's the boss. He's in charge. And do you know what the other thing was that I thought, this is so sad to me, but I thought, what a nice guy. This is so nice. He's not going to expect me to do all these grown up things that I don't even know what he's talking about yet. I'm so lucky. I bet there's all these other girls that wish they were in my spot right now because he picked me. So that was all the stuff that was going on. And that slow pacing like went out the window so quickly to the point where he raped me on the side of the road up over a hill. I know this is, this is a tough part to listen to. This is the toughest thing I'm going to say and then it's going to be over. I promise, but I think it's really important to say that it was dusk. It was Route 27. Whenever I pass there, it's just not fun. And we're on this like hill. And what's crazy is that as this was happening, my head kept hitting a rock. And all I kept thinking of was, oh my God, I'm going to need stitches. How am I going to explain this to my mother? And, and that's just, that's what happens when, when you are abused is you compartmentalize, you drift up here, and that's how you survive. But I was just worried about how do I keep the lie going? What am I going to do? How do I keep this going? And then we were walking down when he was done. He took my hand. We walked down the hill. I had tears going down my face and I was praying he wouldn't see because he would be so angry if I wasn't happy about it. And all I kept thinking of was what's wrong with me? I didn't think about what was wrong with him. What was wrong with me that I'm not enjoying this? Why can't I just like this? I know other girls that are doing this stuff and they talk like it's fun. And I thought something was wrong with me. Okay. So I think we all need to take a breath because no one's breathing in this room at all. <laughs> Including me. So let's, can we just take a breath for a second? No, you're still not doing it. <laughs> okay. Sorry that that's a little difficult, but that's, it's an important part of it. But the sexual abuse part wasn't at the biggest part of my time with them. It was all this other stuff. There were, there, were a, there were a lot of abusive incidents, like hundreds. But more of it was going to arcades and playing pinball and talking to them on the phone and a million other things. It's really complicated. Okay. So I continue my entire high school career keeping up the secret. I, like, I was desperate to protect him. I still, in spite of that little story, that's not so little, I loved that man and I would do anything to protect him. And it was my job. And I really, at that point, thought I was going to be going to jail if, like, he had me believe that. So I kept the secret, but when you hold a secret that intense, your body can't contain it all. Something usually gives. And I had so many somatic complaints through high school. I was such a mess. I got 
my depression and anxiety started coming back. And I didn't understand why. Like, I was feeling so good. And like, why? Like, he was so nice. He was building me up. And then all of a sudden, he started tearing me down a little. And I had so many stomach aches. I had migraines. I could not sleep. I broke out in a rash a lot. I had a lot of chest pains. I ended up in the ER once for chest pains. I had no connection of why. But a lot of times, if you're working with kids or whatever, and they're having somatic complaints, a lot of times it could be for other reasons. And so I, I maintained that secret for a really long time. Little mention about control. This man controlled me like I can't even begin. I have a whole chapter written on this one, too. But just to give you a little, a little snippet, his control, the, the minute the sexual abuse began, like that line was crossed, it was very much like if you hear of a battered spouse or something, where all of a sudden, I wasn't smart enough to be able to handle college classes, so I probably shouldn't go to college, okay? I really wasn't pretty at all. Boys weren't gonna like me, and he didn't want me to handle, I have to deal with that rejection, so I should just stay with him. He didn't want me to get my license. He didn't want me to go to the prom. He did not want me to go to college. There, it went on and on and on, and I had to wait at different phone booths that could take incoming calls at that time, like pay phones, and there was a payphone in between the Nord High School and the, and the Peabody. I don't know if anyone remembers that, right? Um, we have payphones. It's like we're really, really old. And so, and so I had to wait there at a certain time every morning for his call. And if I wasn't there, I was surely talking to some boy, and he would be furious. And it was just like the dynamic with my father where I would do anything to prevent the conflict. And it just got perpetuated. And so the control was what kept me silent. I was terrified of anyone finding out. And people don't like to hear this, but I need to say it. I, I, there's nothing I can think of that would have gotten me to report him. Zero. There is nothing. You, you think your kids are going to tell, and, and they, you know, hopefully with some education now, they, you know, they will. There's nothing that I would have done. But if someone intervened during the grooming process and saw all these things, I would have talked about that because everyone knew it, you know? Okay. So I'm going to fast forward a lot and just say that finally it took everything in my life, everything in my power to leave him. He got really scary. He would say things like, I could bury you. It got really bad and he was stalking me. It was really ugly, but I got to the point where my pain outweighed my fear. And I finally broke away and I, that's how I ended up moving to Florida because he was stalking me so badly. And once I got there, it was like I was reborn. And I, my life was amazing, and I, did, I just made up for a lot of lost time in a short amount of time. And We won't talk about all the crazy stuff I did, but oh my goodness, I had a blast. Um, and, and so I just want to leave it behind me, you know? And what I want to say is we hear a lot of times, if she was abused 30 years ago, why didn't she tell? Give me a break 30 years later. There are so many reasons that you cannot even imagine of why someone would not come forward. It is a really hard thing. But I didn't even think twice. I didn't want to think twice. I left it behind. I didn't even really tell people I went through that. I'm like, okay, this is my new life. Moved on, different careers, married, all that stuff. Okay, leave it behind. And then one day, this was about 2002, I was having dinner with a friend, and we were talking about the Mr. Baker ordeal. And she asked me a question that like, stopped me in my tracks. And she said, is he still teaching? Yeah, I think so. Why? She said, do you think he'd ever do that again? I'm like, no. He's not that stupid. Why would he do that? It went on for so long, and it was special. Like, I still thought it was special. You know? There's no way. She just kind of looked at me, looked out the window, and then for a week, that question like bubbled in my head, like, oh my God, what if he did it again? Like, it never dawned on me in a million years that he would have done that again until that I was ready to think about it. Like, you can't rush your journey. You can't. And I just I sat with it for like a month, like, oh my gosh. But I was so afraid of him. He still had power in my head, you know? And so I finally realized, you know, my fear of him doing this and someone else having to deal with him was greater than my fear of him coming after me. So I contacted the principal of the middle school that had been principal when I had attended, and I, I just I called up and I said, look, I you know, one of your teachers, he was in fact still teaching, like one of your teachers molested me years ago, and I just want to make sure your kids are safe. And he, he asked a few questions, and when I identified myself, he said, oh my God, it was Bob Baker, wasn't it? And I froze, and I'm like, how did you, how did you know that? And he said, I don't know. 
He just he spent so much time with you. I mean, he spent time to a lot with a lot of people, but you were really special to him. Oh my God, did he abuse you? Yes, it went on for years. And so after about a half an hour, he said, what do you want me to do? And I didn't go to the police because statute of limitations had passed. I figured, why would you go to the police? And so then I just I said, whatever you need to do to keep the kids safe, I'll help however I can. He said, okay, great. And so I hung up the phone, I'm like, I am Wonder Woman, I am done, yay. And no. And then eight months later, I got contacted by Nord Detectives. And when I talked to them, they said, are you aware of a Bob Baker? And I said, yes. And he said, well, he's in custody. I'm like, oh my gosh. I said, I don't even understand. I haven't even given my statement. He's like, no, he's in custody for statutory rape of two 14-year-old girls. I can talk like about abuse, you know, easily, but this is the hardest thing. This is the most devastating thing. Because what if I come forward sooner? Like what could they have been spared? And I don't want anyone to ever, ever, ever have to feel like that. And that's what fueled me to start speaking out right away. And so I'm not going to talk a lot about them at all just because, you know, confidentiality and that's not my story to tell. But what I can say is that um, the, there was a disclosure about the two girls. Someone contacted the, the guidance counselor who did the right thing and contacted the police. And the police called the superintendent. And that's when the superintendent said, well, there's somebody else that you should talk to. It was me. And it's tough because people didn't believe the girls at first, which you hear about this in the news all the time, victim blaming and not believing until there's more survivors that come up, right? And it's hard, 31 year veteran, no disciplinary actions, right? Right, until they hear that there's a, a third person. And so I went and gave my statement. And, and when they had done investigations, they talked to, they interrogated, they interviewed a lot of teachers that had known us and so many people named me. So many people like that third person's Andrea, wasn't it? And they, so many knew on some level. I don't think anyone knew, knew necessarily, but everybody had this weird, but this was like in the 80s. We didn't even talk about like divorce back then <laughs> or alcoholism, right? Do you remember? Like, not all of you are old enough to remember, but we didn't talk about anything back then. We didn't know about abuse. We didn't know anything. There was no training. There was no training. There was nothing. And so everyone had a sense though. They had that gut feeling, but what do you do, you know? with that and so he was saying he was innocent of course and then when he heard that i was complying he put his head down on the table which blew my mind because he just was a scary guy in my head who would never do that you know and so he accepted a plea bargain so he had six counts against him and he served a year and nine months that's it and he's you know registered sex offender can't teach but you know he's free and the victim served this like emotional life sentence you know um but some really good, strong things have come out of this yuckiness because it fueled me to speak out and share my story. And I ended up becoming wonderful friends with those girls. And we helped each other heal in ways that nothing else could have helped. And I just want to add one thing that there are people like tell me, they're really sweet and they say, you're so courageous to share your story. And I, I want to share how I can do this because I no longer have any shame about this because this is not my shame. This is not my secret, it's his. And if anybody is here holding on to somebody else's shame for what they did to you, you gotta let go of that stuff, <laughs> okay? Because shame is paralyzing. And it's not yours to own, okay? And you, the, you can just, there are miracles that are possible if you can let go of the shame, okay? So the next slide is probably gonna be your favorite of this whole night. <laughs> <laughs> now we're not going to take like a break because we started late and whatever, but I, I just have a, a little favor. I want everyone to just stand up for a second. I usually hate when people make me do this and I'm going to do it to you guys. So I'm sorry. I need you to stand up for a second. I need you to just kind of go like this and breathe. <sighs> just negotiate with your neighbor, please. <laughs> One more time. <sighs> okay, sit down. Thank you. I had to do that because I really need to do that, but I look stupid doing it alone. So thank you for helping me with that. And now I'm going to share a joke. Because, like, it's just it's a hard story, and we, we need to shift gears, okay? All right. Are you ready? I, I launched a podcast recently. It's called Andrea Speaks Out, and it's about sexual abuse in terms of healing and prevention. 
Um, and it's like a positive spin, but it's still intense. So humor and laughter have helped me heal almost more than anything. It's really important. So you can't take yourself that seriously. So I end every episode with a really stupid dad joke. So are you ready? This one's my favorite bad one. Okay. <laughs> I'm so bad at telling jokes. What's, what's the difference between people from Dubai and people from Abu Dhabi? That people from Dubai don't like the Flintstones, but the people from Abu Dhabi do. <laughs> oh, that's a pity laugh, but I don't you. <laughs> Is that funny? That's like really funny. Like you can tell that to anybody. And at first people get like, oh, is this going to be like transformed? It's just stupid. Okay, thank you. Do you feel like better than a minute and a half ago? We can do this. Like I have finally learned in the last couple of years of my life to like, that you can control so much of how you're feeling. So I'm just sharing that. Okay. So we're on to the second part of our journey here. Okay. So we're here. We want to protect our children. We're going to talk about a few factoids. Okay. Now, I'm not great at PowerPoint creation. I complain about it constantly. However, I did this on purpose. I didn't put the word red in red on purpose. This isn't a mistake, okay? I put the word behaviors in red for a reason, okay? We're going to talk about red flag behaviors of predators. And what is really important for you to know is that when you're working with kids or you're teaching your kids or for you to know this about yourself, you got to look out for behaviors and not people. Does that help when you think about that a little? Okay. People can fool you, but behaviors are much more clear to see. We're hearing things in the news lately about these people we have on these elevated status, right? Michael Jackson, and I'm not going to get into the whole whatever, but like a lot of people have a hard time believing that. What do we know about him? We know like what he shows us, right? Bill Cosby, like everyone was like, I even look at the work I do. And I'm like, no way. Like, what do we know about Dr. Huxtable? One character that he portrayed or his funny jokes, but we don't, we don't know. R. Kelly, all these things and people can fool us, but it's not even just about the celebrities. Remember the 90% of the ones who can abuse our kids, right? How do you, how do you look out, for, how do you teach your kid to watch out for Uncle Billy or Aunt Susie? You can't, like, how do you look out for the people that you know who you cannot imagine would ever harm a child, right? But behaviors we can educate ourselves about, and that is so much easier to see. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. Okay, so these are just some red flag behaviors, and they vary, and it depends on the age of the child that they're either grooming or abusing, but they're really important, okay? Gift giving is a hallmark red flag. I want to go back. I, there's probably an easier way, but I'm going to go back for it. I have to show you this. It's going to take a while. Anyone have another joke? All right. My senior picture. You see the necklace? Who gave it to me? That, and I was silent, but that was my way of trying to like speak out. I loved the gifts he gave me. That necklace was like the most treasured thing. He gave me jewelry boxes. He gave me these like crystal jewel things um, and music tapes. And, and, and the gifts were just overwhelming. But then they got really uncomfortable because I was like, kid, I couldn't give back equally, you know? Trash bag of gifts one time, like a trash bag. I'm not kidding. And I wasn't the only one. And people had come up to me. I was at Norwood Day like four years ago. And, and somebody came up and said, he gave me the same necklace. He was grooming so many kids. And so anyway, gift giving, a lot of times either money, jewelry. I don't know how much um, child sex trafficking is an issue up here in Florida. It's horrendous. But it happens in a lot of places. And so many times all these dynamics are very similar to the signs and symptoms and dynamics of trafficking. And so many times how they lure kids in is with gifts and money and nice running shoes and jewelry and things like that. And whenever I would receive a gift, it just felt so like conditional. I don't think I knew it at the time, you know, but I felt like I owed him something, but I didn't know what that was. But it's, it's nice to receive them and it's very confusing. So it's just something to look out for. Extra time alone. A lot of times predators want, you know, they need to have access to kids. And I always say, 
If somebody wants to spend more time hanging out with your kid than you do, it might be a problem. Sometimes we don't even want to hang out with them that much, right? And, and a lot of times they're like, oh, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll take her for a ride, or I'll, I'll take her to her events, or I'll take him here. I'll do this with him. I'll spend extra time being the mentor. And it's such a fine line, isn't it? Of someone who wants to make a great difference and would never harm a child. You know, the abusers ruin it for the good ones. It's hard to know, but you want to look for patterns. It's not like one thing. You don't have to worry if there's one question or one statement. It's patterns of behaviors you have to look for. Okay, and they volunteer to help a lot. A lot of times, predators target single parent families. I, mine was a single parent family, and like sometimes the, the single parent is so grateful to just have some help. I was a single mom for a long time, and it was exhausting, and it's so much work, and you can't be there for everything. And the kid is looking for, like I said, like a, a, a father figure or a mother figure or whatever. And so a lot of times, you know, if they can spend extra time with you, Sometimes the parents are grateful, okay? And they single out your child. So many times I've heard so many stories of both sides of it, whether they're saying to the, the parent, oh, you know, she's really special. She's got a gift. If I just work with her a little bit, she's going to go straight to whatever college. You know, let me just work with her a little. Or the flip side is, you know what, I think she needs a little more attention. I'm happy to help, okay? Now, again, it, just, it doesn't mean one teacher saying that once is an abuser, but it's good. you've got to keep your eyes open, your ears open, or maybe you just, you know, hire a tuner, right? You, you got to look for all of the things and keep them all in mind. Gains the trust of par the parents in the community, okay? We had Mr. Baker and his wife over for dinner, okay? And they, and they were just, it was just so amazing to have them over. We, we, we all trusted them, everybody. Everybody trusted them. And this, they groom a community. I don't know if you've seen the, the Finding Neverland documentary yet about Michael Jackson. Or, you know, I haven't watched it yet. Like, I have to manage all the abuse stories that I'm encountered with. But I've heard so many comments and how some people are really angry with the, the mothers. Like, how could they not see? How could they? Until you walk in someone's shoes, you just can't judge. You don't know. And yeah, you wish you would, but they tr it was Michael Jackson, a celebrity, giving a kid a chance, and, and they trust him. They think they know him. We don't know. How well do we really know anybody? Like, yeah, the other I hardly know my spell some days. Like, come on. <laughs> That's not true. I know him a little bit. But you know what I mean. This just, you need to just be aware. It's all about awareness. Social media contact. I didn't, this is something that I did not have to worry about with social media. If he had access to me through a cell phone, I cannot imagine the pictures I would have been receiving. I got some Polaroids from that man. I know. It's just cringeworthy. Can you imagine if he's sending me Polaroids of stuff in the mail? Can you imagine what he was sent over a text or an instant message or whatever? And you hear it. You, do you hear the stories? I mean, there's, there's just, there, it is 24-7 access now to children. And, and for the ones, the, you know, no, I'm going to save that to later. <laughs> Never mind. Um, in terms of, like, with younger kids okay a lot of times the grooming includes physical grooming and crossing the boundaries slowly physically to desensitize them to touch that happens a lot but that even happened with with me with him where i think he held my hand like once before he kissed me but he told me that he went to a high school party and held somebody else's hand there he told me that he groomed me through words of saying the things he did with other kids and so crossing the boundaries and a lot of times it like one thing that you need to be aware of is lap sitting. A lot of abuse stories I hear about with people, kids sitting on laps. And it's just unfortunate we have to think about this, but it's the reality. And tickling. Think about tickling, okay? Like it can be harmless or whatever, it seems like it. But that is an easy way for a little brush on the hip or the butt or whatever. And the kid might have a little reaction, but then think, well, I guess it's okay, you know? and then another, and then a little bit more, and they get desensitized, and they don't trust their instincts all the time. They can often create a sense of secrecy, and it can be subtle, it can be big. For me, it was a statement like, you can't tell anybody. A lot of times when you're a kid, you don't even need to be told that, do you? Stuff happened in my house, and not once was it said, you can't say anything, but I knew 100%, no one can know about this. And so when a predator is building up 
they, they, they are, and I need to go back a little bit to who they're targeting because I didn't say this a whole lot. I had a teacher once after I gave a presentation say, can you talk to the kids, the girls, about not dressing so provocatively? Oh, I start to twitch a little when I hear that. I understand the question, but that is not what this is about. It is not what this is about. A lion, when they're stalking prey, are they going to go after the, the strongest, fastest animal in that pack? No, they're going to go over the, to the invisible stragglers where people aren't really going to see them and miss them a whole lot. And it's really important. It's really important to know that. Repeatedly giving compliments. And a lot of times they become physical compliments. I mean, I get compliments about all these different things, but then when I get physical compliments, so uncomfortable and so grateful. It's so confusing. And if you notice an adult, who is just giving these compliments over and over to a certain kid or to a lot of kids, grooming and stuff. It's just worthy of a conversation with them that maybe, or the types of compliments. And I, you know, I know there's a big push to just compliment a kid on their strength or, you know, oh, you haven't given up, that's so good, rather than their appearance, things like that. And creates a dependency. Oh my goodness, I depended on that man so much emotionally uh, for uh, all my emotional needs for a long time and a lot of times they will isolate the victim away from the family away from their friends so that they need them more and then it gets really hard to break away or for them to be able to think for themselves that's important okay so some warning signs that a kid's being abused obviously it, it depends on the age you know, the younger the child is, the, the more different the signs are going to be. I don't think I gave a whole lot of outward signs. A lot of people knew I was not happy or I had issues and things. But I tried really hard to just, I was busy. I did so many things and so many activities. And it's hard to know if it's sexual abuse. Is it a problem at home? It's very hard to know what the issues are, but like, you gotta ask the questions. Just ask. And I wouldn't have answered, but it's planting a seed. And if I had had someone said, is anyone touching you inappropriately or something, I would be like, oh my gosh, no. If they were, I would tell you, don't you, I was such a good liar. I was such a good liar. I was created to be one. But if someone had asked, it would have, it would have filed away, like, oh my gosh, they know. And so maybe this isn't okay. And don't underestimate the power of planting a seed. It's, it's really important. So a lot of things you need to look for are patterns uh, and changes, okay? Changes in behaviors, okay? Like sudden changes, okay? A lot of times that can happen with kids. And again, this could be, all these signs could be sexual abuse. It could be a lot of different things. So I don't want you to go home with your kid, like all of a sudden doesn't want to eat dessert. You're like, oh my God, I'm being abused. No. <laughs> Please don't do that, <laughs> okay? But you want to just take everything into account. And these are just some things, OK? Appetite changes. I, appetite changes either like just emotional eating or like completely losing appetite because they're depressed. A lot of things you want to look for that. Changes in grades. I had A's and B's the whole time. I really don't know how. I don't know how I kept going to class and doing my homework and taking my tests. I don't know how. But I, in a way, I think that was like I could just shut my brain down and just focus on that. But not every kid can do it. A lot of kids, they just start failing and they can't tell you. They can't say, this person's being really bad to me. So you have to keep that in mind, okay? Like losing interest in friends, activities, they start to get below, they just stop caring as much as they used to. I've had a lot of parents talk to me about that because they just don't understand why. And a lot of times the kids don't know, you know, they can't, and they can't talk about it. And so, Keep planting seeds, keep asking, don't be afraid to ask the questions, okay? Um, changes in interpersonal interactions. I started to get, I, I would like try to drop these stupid weird hints to people, but I didn't want them to ask me. Like, don't find out, but I couldn't help myself. Does that make sense? That sounds really weird how I'm saying that. Someone tell me that makes sense, I don't know. Yeah? Because <laughs> you're a kid, you don't know what you're doing. And I, this is real, I don't think I've ever shared this, but it kind of came back to me. One time, I went to school, I was waiting at the bus stop, and I remember this, I 
put mascara under my eye to look like I had a black eye. And then I, I was like, at school, I'm like, this is so stupid, what am I doing? I'm like, what am I gonna say? Like, and, I, and I washed it off. I was so desperate for someone to just stop it for me, but I didn't want to be responsible for who, how someone found out, okay? And so my interactions with people were kind of erratic and kind of needy, very needy with certain people, and then kind of standoffish. I know with my family, I have some beautiful cousins here who I was not that connected with my cousins at all because like, I, I, he didn't want me hanging out with them. And I also like, I couldn't be myself. How could I, I didn't know how to interact. So I just withdrew more and more and more. And it can change and a lot of kids just watch for the changes. Okay, just look for the changes. And again, just look for everything as, as patterns. Um, substance abuse issues, I did a lot of drinking pretty young at different times. And it clearly, I know for me, was like self-medicating. It was absolutely like I just either want to feel numb, I want to feel anything other than what it was. And nobody would have believed I was drinking back then. Well, you would have. <laughs> One person in here knew. Oh, two. <laughs> okay, I take it back. Um, you know, and there's, you know, so many people experiment, but, but my drinking was to not feel. I wanted to feel anything else. Okay. And so there's a, there's a variety of, a variety of things, but substance abuse can be an issue. Eating disorders. I was a mess with eating disorders. Oh my gosh. I, my body image to this day, that's probably, I'm, I'm affected almost the most with body image for a lot of different reasons where I feel like I take up so much room. And I'm better, I'm a lot better, but I, for, my, for me, my eating disorders back there, it was a way to control like what was going on into my body which is just really crazy to say. Um, and, it, it, and I had control. It was one place in my life where I could control what I ate. I went one time for seven days without eating anything. I had water and gum. And I climbed up, I was in high school, I was in a play, and I climbed up the stairs in my house and I collapsed. And I'm like, okay, I can't even do this well. And so kids go to great lengths to just numb out how they're feeling. And you don't understand, you're not making the connections. Depression and anxiety, obviously. Somatic complaints, I mentioned that a lot. A lot of physical issues. I've talked to a lot of healthcare workers who see kids who have stomach issues and, and they know that it's, there's this other issue going on, but they can't talk about it, but their bodies do. Our bodies can speak for us. So a lot of times for younger kids, if they can have this increased sexual knowledge that they shouldn't have at their age, and it comes out in like sexual play, and you really want to be aware of that. It's really, really telling if their play changes or their writing changes. A lot of times kids will write it in their little story for school. So that's important to be aware of. Um, cutting, cutting behavior is a big one. I never did that because I'm the biggest baby on the planet. I would never cut myself, oh my gosh. But there's a lot of, particularly females, but there's some males who do it too. Where, and so many of them tell me it's just a release to just feel something, because some of them are so numb and dissociated, which means you are not in your body at all, you're not present, and you can't feel anything. And some of them, they're containing so much, and they just cut to release, and it's a terrible problem. And they need help desperately, and they can't talk about it. And so that's pretty common. Um, and a sudden change in secrecy of their use of the technology and computers, where all of us, you know, if I, you know, I was very secretive just on the phone at night when I was talking to them. You know, I, and I can't imagine having a cell phone. And all of a sudden, if one kid is just has certain behaviors, and all of a sudden you notice that they're going into a room. I mean, and some of it, again, is normal. You know, a 14-year-old, all of a sudden they get more private. Just pay attention to all of those, okay? Okay. So, language is safety. This, the Kids Safe Foundation is an organization that I've worked with the last few years. I'm not directly linked anymore, but I was a regional director for them for a while. Uh, has an amazing language of safety I want to share with you that you can use with your kids right away. Don't go home and use every single one of these tomorrow because your kids' heads are going to explode. I have so many parents that tell me, like, I told them to do this and safe touch and blah, 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 and then the kids <laughs> just integrate it slowly. Okay, please. But it's so many times we can tell a little bit of information with our kids, but then we get stuck on certain language and whatever. And it doesn't have to be scary, and it doesn't have to be about sexual abuse or prevention. It's about personal safety. Just like we teach them to stop, drop, and roll, right, in case of a fire. We need to give them skills for certain scenarios. It's really important. So the first one I want to talk about is safe and unsafe touch. 
A lot of times, I think in the past, we used to talk about good touch and bad touch. Remember that? We used to say that a lot. The problem with that is that the reality is sexual abuse can feel good. And that's a really hard concept to even sit with, but it's very important that you know. Your body is wired to respond to physical sexual touch. And how confusing is that for a kid? Okay, that, that can trigger so many things. So if you're calling it bad touch, but it felt good, how, how confusing. So all these concepts, safe and unsafe touch, you want your kid to learn at an early age to tune into how something makes them feel inside. Okay, and you need to talk about this over and over. It's not a one conversation thing. A safe touch is something that makes you feel good, warm, safe, cozy. And when you're talking with your kids, you can talk about a hug. Someone giving you a high five, fist bump, a teacher patting you on the shoulder. How does that make you feel? Oh, good, it makes me feel. Or snuggling with the dog, snuggling with mom. Those are safe touches. That's the stuff you can talk about, very simply. You don't have to talk about a predator touching you, okay? But you want them to tune into how does the touch make you feel, okay? Unsafe touch has to do with making them feel yucky, scared, mad, confused, all those kind of things. And you can ask them, you can use examples of someone pushes you on the playground, someone pulls your hair, someone shoves you. How does that make you feel? Mad, sad, they're not my friend anymore, confused. And you can talk about it that way and it's, they get, start to get this language and, and tuning in, how does that make me feel? How does it make me feel? Okay, really important for safe and unsafe touch. And the, the key to it is whenever you get an unsafe touch, that's when you report. You report if you have an unsafe touch. Someone pushed me in the playground and, and tell me about that. I want to know. And so you process with them. You don't always have to you know, go farther, but so that they're used to you believing that they got an unsafe touch, which is the bottom line. But if you don't start with the small stuff, why are they going to tell you the big stuff? It's really important. Okay, good and bad secrets. I don't like the term secrets at all. I like surprises hate secrets, but the bottom, I think the reality is that there's secrets in the world and kids keep secrets. And so it's the same concept with good and bad secrets. How does that secret, holding that secret, how does it make you feel? And then with a good secret, and again, this is a process of working with your kids. It's not one little conversation because it's a little confusing based on their age. A good secret is something that the secret teller wants you to tell eventually. They want you to be able to tell and it makes you feel happy and excited like a surprise party for mom. We're gonna go buy your brother a present. Let's wait until Saturday for the party. He's gonna be so surprised, but then you can tell him. And just how does it make you feel? Good, and the kids are great. They can identify that. It's weird that they can usually identify the bad stuff more than the good, it's weird. But so a bad secret is when someone never ever wants you to tell. You're never able to tell, and it, how does it make you feel? Scared, bad, and if you don't know the difference between if it's a good or bad secret, come to me. And, I'll, and we'll talk about it and we'll figure it out together. But how, have them tune in to how holding the secret makes you feel. Because I'm telling you, a kid who keeps secrets is a predator's best friend. Okay, really important early on to work on this topic. Okay, this one I just threw in because I think this is really helpful for people who work or have little kids. The difference between reporting and tattling. Because tattling can make you go crazy, <laughs> right? Oh my gosh, tattling. And so we talk about this with kids a lot. Reporting is when you go to a grown-up when you need help because of safety issues. Tattling is when you go to a grown-up because you want to get somebody in trouble. Right? And it's really kind of clear. And a lot of times it's still more work like, okay, he cut you in line. Are you trying to get no? But that's not safe that he cut me in line. <laughs> okay. So it's a lot of work. You have to work with them. But if you can keep role playing and talking with them about like is that a situation where you need to report or is that just tattling and it's, it's a work in progress but it's a nice distinction and it's, it's fairly concrete that a lot of kids can understand circle of safe adults this is a really helpful thing to do with kids you want them to have at least three people aside from yourself that they can go to well no you can be one of them but to at least two, at least two additional adults that they can go to with either a problem or something wonderful okay three and the reason is because we're not always available, even if we think we are. Their perception of us, if we're on our phone or we're working or we're trying to get our million things done and they keep bugging us for, you know, two hours. Like, sometimes you're not available and they need to talk so that they can go to somebody else. And this can apply all through different stages. Even in college, you want them to have different adults to go to. You don't want to be their sole source. And 
one thing that's a really important message to give to your kids. If something is important, you need to report it. You keep reporting to adult until you are believed and you are helped. That is so important because sometimes in a someone's circle of safe adults, remember that 90%, what if one of those people was the one who hurt them? Okay, then, and, and the kids ask us this sometimes. And like, oh, then that's a really good question. What if there's somebody? Well, what can you do? Who could you go to? Oh, maybe that's why you have three people. And if they don't listen or they don't believe you because guess what? There are so many kids who've been abused and tell and are not believed. It breaks my heart and makes me furious. It happens all the time and they will never speak again. Okay, so if they can get that, imagine if they can get that message early, you tell and you keep telling until somebody listens and helps you. Until somebody helps you is really big. So that's an important one. And you also want to let the people who are chosen for the circle, let them know, hey, you made it to the circle, good job, you know? And then make sure the kid knows how to access the help. Make sure they know the phone, phone number, everything. Okay, quick note on part, private parts. The easy way to say it, private parts are any part of your body covered by your bathing suit. I think a lot of people are using this at this point. I wish I had known that when I had, when Zach was little, but it's so much easier than, well, cover the penis, cover the, it's just, anything that your bathing suit covers, private parts, that's one, okay? Two, you know, you have your rules, and I think people are pretty good about this. Nobody touches your private parts unless I'm helping you or it's the doctor, but also, remember we said about older kids, abusing younger kids. No one else is just allowed to see your private parts or touch them, and you're not supposed to see anyone else's. Okay, just the thing. And the third thing I want to drive home, you got to use the anatomical words for the private parts. I'm saying private parts, but an elbow is an elbow and a penis is a penis. Say it with me, penis. <laughs> Nobody said it. Say it. Yay, look at that, I'm so proud of you. Very good. <laughs> it's so important. If we have nicknames for these things, right, it's because it's our discomfort. Right? Or it's something we carried on from our families or something. What message does that send to the kid? Can't talk about it. Or it's like somehow different or it's not okay. And if, God forbid, something happens to them, they need to be able to say exactly what happened. It's really, really important. So, what if game is awesome? Okay? Um, so, do you ever watch the, um, you know, like a show like 2020? or something, and where they have these things where kids are in a playground and they have this undercover guy and the parents somehow are watching on camera, right? And the parents, and, and he's gonna say, hey, you wanna see my new puppy or whatever? Have you guys seen those things, right? And the parents are always like, she'll never go with them. We talk about this all the time. Every freaking time they're like, okay, I'm gonna see the puppy. <laughs> and the parents are like, oh, how can this happen? Right, and they're not, are they terrible parents? Of course not. Kids need to role play this stuff over and over because it's so different. It's so different when you're in this situation, even us when we know better, but sometimes we get caught up in a situation and it's, so hard, it's harder to respond than we think it would, like you get kind of pressured into something. And you know how I said like a kid who keeps a secret is a predator's best friend? You know who else is a best friend? A kid who is blindly obedient to adults. Really important. Now, you need to follow the rules and the teacher says to line up and everything, but you need to make sure that it's okay for them to say, I'm not comfortable with that. If something's really uncomfortable, and, and it's work, you know, like I, I, I tested all this stuff with my son, and so he would throw it back at me, like, I'm not comfortable with doing the dishes right now. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Like, oh yeah, deal with it. Yeah, do it. Okay, but so it's, all of this is not a one shot, you know, stop deal. But, but they have to role play. And the what if game is wonderful. And, and so many times when you're driving, you know, or you're waiting in line at Dis oh, Disney, isn't that funny? I'm not in Florida. <laughs> We're all going to Disney on the weekends and stuff. So if you're waiting in line for what? What's up here? I don't know. The Science Center, how Science Museum. Okay, there we go. If you're waiting in long lines or anything, um, just casual conversations where you just, okay, what would you do if? And kids love doing this stuff. But you need to do it over and over, reinforce. And there's certain things we do, it, it, kids say something with check first. Will you always check with, check with me before blah, blah, blah. Anything, check first. And so do scenarios like, what would you do if, like our neighbor, if you're playing outside and, she's, and she says, hey, you want to come and make chocolate chip cookies with me? And a lot of kids are like, okay, because some of, especially this is such a small town, you know your neighbor so well. And you just don't know. So just one little check first might be all it takes to just protect a kid. Okay, and what would you do if, and there's so many scenarios, you can fill in the blanks, but just what if, what would you do if? And you can do this all the way through college. What would you do if, or high school and they're at a party, you know? Um, 
I, I'm going to bring this up for language of safety with teens, okay? Because, you know, this was for a lot for younger kids. But we got to focus on boundaries, boundaries about everything, not even just about like abuse stuff. So much um, boundaries come into play with their friends, with their teachers, with their coaches, with their, you know, dating situations and everything. And I, this is a little tough to put out there, but I'm going to say it anyway. They learn from us so much as parents and as teachers, right? I want you to check your own relationships. Okay, like honestly think about it and what are they learning from you with your boundaries with each other? How healthy is your relationship? Okay, I got separated from my husband when my son was like three and it was brutal and everything. My relationship was a disaster and all I kept thinking of was this is what he's going to learn as a role model. And, and it, was, it was just not healthy. And you want to talk so much about healthy relationships with your kids. And you know what, if your relationship is unhealthy, try just just state it, just saying, it, like, you don't say, my healthy, my relationship with dad isn't healthy, but you can just say, well, you could, but that might be weird, but you could just say, you know, I think dad and I, we should probably talk more, but we end up fighting a lot, don't we? Like, one little sentence could open up a huge conversation, like, we really need to work on this. That's just, not, you know, like, just, just speak the truth, and, and you, they're learning from you more than anybody, and you're living it, and how are they going to know how to have healthy dating relationships and friendships? Friendships are huge and how they let themselves be treated. It's so important. So boundaries, very important. And you really want them to be able to say no if they're uncomfortable about anything. And you want them to be able to come to you if they, or call you, they're at a party, they're drinking or something, and you know, somebody's drinking, they need a ride home. If you freak out about every D or F that they get, how likely are they gonna be to call you when something worse is happening? I'm totally guilty of this too, so I'm like, it's really hard to do, and yet it's really important to have, we have like a poker face of just like, okay, because think about the big stuff. You want them to come to you for the big stuff, but you want them to know it's okay to say no if they're uncomfortable, and it's okay to call you no matter what, or tell you things no matter what. It's easier said than done, because we react to stuff, like sometimes little stuff, sometimes big stuff, but that is, that's really important. And one thing up there, I think this is so important to tell kids early, if a relationship or a friendship or anything, if someone tells you that's supposed to be secret, that is not a healthy relationship. For them to know it. Because all of a sudden, if you, if you don't hear that and then you're in one, and then you, you, it's your first time thinking about it, you know, but if they hear that anything secretive is not healthy. Okay. All right, teens and technology. Last chunk here. Technology is their reality. Their brains are wired differently than ours were. Okay, we cannot escape this. And I have a lot of parents who just say, oh, they give up and they're like, I can't understand any of the stuff they're doing now. You can't, you don't have that luxury to keep your kids safe. The internet is like a predator's playground. The more you know, the more chance you have to protect them. All right, I recommend having a computer contract. And you can write your own, there's stuff online. It's a privilege, not a right, to have a computer. A, a cell phone and they're gonna you know be saying you know you're not the boss of me you're all those lines and I'm 14 years old and I should be trusted you don't trust me okay it's not about trusting them it's about not trusting everything else that can influence their lives it's huge there's so many issues and so they can just sign a contract that says that you have access to the passwords every app that they have to keep them safe okay or they lose it I'm just throwing it out there just a little suggestion um, you want to be aware of the school's policies in terms of technology, but also in terms of the teachers. Are they allowed to have like Facebook friendships or connections or Snapchat connections? Find out and, and you need to have this conversation. There is no reason a teacher needs to have any contact with a kid on social media. There are plenty of apps, like I don't know what you have here, but like at home I have so many like Remind and all these texting apps because my son's in choir and theater and they need to contact them, like sports, they need to contact kids, you know, because of like um, rehearsals or whatever change, but I'm dialed into all of those. I get the same, same messages and I, it's so important that you know exactly what's going on, okay? Um, you need to know what apps are on your kids' phones. And I'm saying teens, but now it's like, how old are they having, you know? I love the program of like, wait till eighth or whatever, wait till eighth grade but not everybody has that. So 
I wrote down, I always share some troubling apps that you need to be aware of. And they change so fast that I have to change the slide every time I do a training. And so I have my little cheat sheet. But these are just, just a, a, some of them that you just want to be aware of, OK? They don't have to be troubling, but there's potential there, OK? So you guys know what Snapchat is. I'm sure most people are familiar. There's something called Snap Map. And so it allows your location to be placed on a map when you open it every time you open it. Okay, so like if you post an image to our story, it automatically posts your, your location. And so anybody can find out where that kid is at that moment, which just opens up some, some issues. Okay, Marco Polo, friends interact via disappearing videos, like Snapchat, right? Where the things just disappear. But the videos disappear, and so if there's bullying or there's inappropriate stuff, there's no proof it's gone. Okay, that's Marco Polo. Say at dot me. This one, oh my gosh. So um, it allows for anonymity between the users. And it, it invites anonymous feedback about yourself. Can you imagine? Look at us as adults, right? If we had the opportunity to give anonymous feedback to someone who's really driving us crazy, what would you like, want to like, say, right? There's some mean people online, some mean grown-ups, right, right now? They're not even anonymous and they're being cruel. Can you imagine? Imagine teenagers, and they're, they're taking their personal URL and put it on Instagram, and then their friends can do this and give them anonymous feedback, and there's so much cyberbullying and so many, so many dangerous things. Yellow is like t um, t um, Tinder for teens, for 13 to 17-year-olds to swipe and write, okay? Um, after school, it provides anonymity for users, and that is for kids. It connects kids at the same school, but it's, it's anonymous, and the bullying stuff I've heard has been terrible. So just to be aware, and this is totally depressing, isn't it? There's some good stuff, too, but you need to know. Calculator. Has anyone heard about this? Apple, yes. Apple pulled it from their store. So in case you don't know, pictures and videos can be hidden underneath a password-protected button. So it looked like a calculator, and you put in a password, it goes away, and all these images are there. And so now that's gone, but there could be dozens of other ones out there. So what's really important, these are just like a sampling, okay? You want to sit down with your kid and have them show you every single app that they're using and show me how it works. And, and they, you just need to keep this current. And again, just emphasize, I want you to be careful of the people that are out there, you know? Um, and then a couple of just three random ones that I picked up that are good for parents kind of keeping an eye on their kids, okay? Bark, it traces, it, I mean, it tracks what teens are doing on social media. So it just, it, it just tracks that, and it will alert you if there's any cyberbullying or sexting going on. It can alert you. Limitly li can limit screen time. And then the other ones track kids. It's similar to Limitly, but it also allows you access to your kids' contacts and um, their location, everything, really important, okay? So I'm going to give you a couple of quick resources, then we're going to open up to questions and answers. So kids say, these books are amazing. They're available on Amazon. It's Jack teaches his friends to be safe. My body is special and belongs to me. Wonderful for like three-year-olds to like eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds. Amazing. Talks about all those subjects and more in a really friendly way. Kids love it. Okay. And then I have a very sorely neglected website called Andrea Speaks <laughs> um, But I have a blog that I haven't written in a while if you want to check it out. Um, but as my contact is there if you ever want to email me. And also I, my podcast is on here and you can access all the episodes. I have like 12 episodes and I have a lot of, uh, I've had great guests. They've been great. Um, okay. Oh, that's a lot of talking. I don't know how, no, don't do that. <laughs> okay, we're not, gonna, thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't know how you guys are still awake. It's like almost 8 o'clock on a weeknight. Like, aren't you proud of yourselves that we're still awake? Wow, that's a lot. Thank you for hanging in there with me. All right, so let's do some questions and answers. We'll do this for a few minutes, and then I can, like, sign a book or whatever. Um, question, answer, comment. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was a really good liar. It was really bad. And so I, I would like make up who I was hanging out with. I drew, that was, we drew the line. I'm like, I guess this has to be in secret. Um, I feel terrible, you know? I just was desperate. So I would walk down the street to the Prescott School. He'd pick me up there. And I would say, I'm going over to whoever's house. And it'd take me to three, over to Framingham to Fun and Games and Hula Hands. 
It was funny how you just remember these places. Yeah, and I would just make up things and I would go other places. I'd be secretive about the phone. Yeah, and so, I mean, most of the time. And then once in a while I would sprinkle in, oh, I'm going to see Mr. Baker. Because I was smart enough to say, like, I'm not, you know, Mom, I can't. Like, he's a really good friend, so at least sometimes I have to see him. You know? Did you ever tell him? Yep. That's a whole, ch that's a whole other. So we'll be here for, like, five days. <laughs> My poor mom. <laughs> yeah, I did. But it was a long time later. It was a long time later. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how did you keep it together? Because I always look at you as this beautiful person. Oh, you're and so that, sweet. No, I did. Sorry. And, you know, I mean, I sang with you in the choir. And yeah, we I just looked at you like, God, she's got it together. I wish I was her. Wow. You know, and how did you... It's always so strange when I... Can you guys hear her? Yeah. Like, saying, like, how did I keep it together? And... and face. Yeah. And, and it's always shocking if someone gives me that feedback because I was such a mess. But I think I grew up learning how to compartmentalize. So when I was at school, it was like this safe place for me away from him and away from other stuff. So when I got to sing, I was so happy. I could be happy like in the moment, you know what I mean? Um, but I thought everyone thought I was like an alien. Like, like it's so funny how the disconnect is so strong. Um, I was just the fat, ugly kid in my head because that's what I was told. You know, and so it's, it's interesting, but a lot of kids are like that. And a lot of us lead, like have masks and lead double lives. And I have connected with so many people who were in so much pain when they were kids. And none of us knew it. Ooh, I mean, I'm so not the only one. But we don't know that right next to us we could have an ally. So I, that's all I can say is I would just compartmentalize really well and would section off things. Because that's just, I, I rolled into it really easily. So thank you. Yes. Um, Kendra, thank you. I think the story is so dynamic on many levels, but I have to say what's like really not in my stomach with Karen is the end of your book. You say that you call Mr. C and tell him what happened. So first of all, I grew up with my stuff school area. So when you were when I was reading your book, I knew who you were talking about. I knew who you were talking about. Um, so when you called Mr. Mm -hmm. um, I've since chatted with childhood friends about your book, and undoubtedly, every time they say, well, don't you remember this? And remember when that happened? And remember him? And remember her? What bothers me is that people knew this was happening, the administration knew that this was happening, and nobody reported it. So yeah. this information is unbelievable and so appreciative, but as a parent, what I'm taking away is our administration know that teachers are behaving badly on many different levels and just not reporting it. And I feel like as parents, we need to be aware of that. And I, under, I totally understand your question. And there were some mistakes that were made, for sure. You know, um, and this is why we need training so much. We need so much training. And that's why it is amazing that I'm here right now. And I commend this administration from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Because it's not easy, you know, but the, the key is to acknowledge the mistake that you made and make it right and change it. And the fact that they're willing to, to talk about it, like, we're not going to get anywhere. They, they, there were some bad mistakes made. And this happens everywhere. This happens so frequently that people sweep it under the rug, or it's called passing the trash, where they write a recommendation letter and quietly send them to another school district. You know, and it's just, and, and I'm working, I won't give up until we're trying to get these laws passed to stop passing the trash. And I'm trying to educate, and so few schools will let me in to train their teachers. And, and it's just, but so, like, the fact that I'm here is just, is beautiful. And this administration, I can't believe the incredible proactive feeling I get from them. And that they're like, zero tolerance, and they know exactly what to do, and to report it immediately. And we just need more training. We need so much more training because a lot of people got hurt. A lot of people got hurt. And it was in the 80s, and there was zero, there was just zero training. And there's, there's still such little training. And there's a lot of liability. If people don't go forward, they, go, they can go to jail. And a lot of people miss that, you know? And so I totally understand your frustration and almost like a, a panic, you know? Like, how are we going to know this isn't happening again? You know, how do we know that, that the right thing's going to be done? The fact that this administration has let me share my story and, and, and help offer some tools is a really good sign in my book that that's all you can do. 
when you make a mistake is to own it and say, okay, no more and let's move forward. I had a school district, there's a county in Florida, four teachers were arrested in one year. One year. And that superintendent had me come in and I did a training for every single principal in that county. There were like 60 of them. And it was great. And, and so many other schools are just afraid we can't talk about it because it's a can of worms. And, and this one is like, enough. This is what we're doing. And they, they let all the parents know, like, this is what we're doing because this is unacceptable. And, and so I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you for your question. Yes. A little louder, sorry. Do you want the mic? That's okay. Thank you. I've gotten a ton of support, but I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I totally agree. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We need training. It's, it's, you're speaking volumes, and this is what I say all the time, and, and all I can do so, you know, I don't get hopeless or whatever is I'm just going to keep plugging away. And there's a lot of us now on board trying to, trying to increase it, and it's one step at a time. And it's one little victory at a time, and... I know. And that's what we need to just teach our kids to, and the adults for the instincts, yeah. Yeah. Should be mandatory training. And I've been going to some colleges to teach the education department, the education majors. Yeah, thank you. Okay, maybe one or two more. Are we okay on time? Are we good? I can't thank you enough for your support, your love, your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have some books for sale down here. Um, just $10 a book. I'm just going to do a little discount. And um, my square thing broke, so let's just cash your check. But someone said that you could just pay with a, a check later if you want. So. I'm happy to do it and sign it, and um, just thank you for this opportunity. This is like this was amazing, and thank you so much, you guys, for this. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.